Hi, and welcome back to analyzing software using deep learning. We are in a module on token vocabulary and uh, source code embeddings. And this is the second part in which we will um, have a more detailed look at one kind of obtaining token embeddings, namely by pre-training them. So in the previous part, we've seen what the token vocabulary problem is, which is this problem of having um, too many uh, tokens uh, to reason about. And now here we will see one very popular approach for addressing this problem. In the previous part, we've seen how we can obtain a set of tokens that we consider to be our vocabulary. And now here we want to look into the question of how to represent a given token as a vector. Why do we care about this question? Well, very simple, because a neural model, so a deep learning model, uh, requires vectors as inputs. It cannot just reason about tokens given as, say, a string, but we somehow need to turn um, these strings into um, a vector. So essentially what we need is a mapping that looks like this. So it takes um, a token out of our vocabulary V and then maps this into a real valued vector of length K. So just a vector of K uh, real um, ve uh, values. There's one very simple and maybe a bit naive way of getting such a representation. Um, and that is the so-called one-hot encoding. So what we are given is um, uh, the set V of tokens. And what we do here is to give each um, token T in the set V a unique index. So you can basically think of just uh, looking at the set V as a list, and then you take the uh, index in this list for each token as the index of the token. And then we are creating a vector um, by taking a vector that has the length of our vocabulary size, and all elements in this vector are zeros, except for one element, which is the index of t. And this element is set to one. So essentially what you get is what is um, written down here. So you have a vector that maps every token t to um, uh, a vector of length k, where k is the size of the vocabulary. And the ith element of this vector is either zero or one, and it's only one if i happens to be the index um, that represents this token t. So let's have a look at a simple example to illustrate this idea of one hot encoding. And for this example, let's assume that our set v, so our vocabulary, consists of the keyword if, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, and also id, which is just an abstraction of all the identifiers that we may have in our code. So now what we do is we will create this uh, mapping E that takes some token and maps it to a vector, in this case to a vector of length four, because that's the size of V. And specifically, um, we will look at the position or the index of each of these tokens in a list uh, representation of the set V. And for example, for um, the token if, we will then get a vector that consists of a one at the beginning, because if happens to be our first um, uh, first token, followed by all zeros until we have reached four elements, and that's the length of the vector. And then similarly for um, for the open parenthesis token, we would have all zeros except that the first element, because so the element at at index two um, is um, is one, and all the rest is zero. For the closing parenthesis, we would um, have the one here. And then for the ID, everything would again be zero, except in this case, the last element, which then is one. So this is what is called one-hot encoding. It's very naive and simple way of encoding um, um, a token vocabulary. The um, big benefit is that it's simple, but the big disadvantage is the size of the vectors that we'll get. Because if we have a large vocabulary, then we will get very long vectors, and most of them are actually um, just filled with zeros, and there's just one somewhere. So it's not a very um, space-efficient way of encoding um, tokens. A much better way of encoding uh, tokens, and this is what we'll look at next, are so-called token embeddings. So here the idea is again that we take the tokens and map them into a vector space. But in this case, the vector space does not have 
um, the same size as our vocabulary, but it actually is much smaller than this uh, size of we. And the idea here is that we want to map every token to a vector such that tokens that are semantically similar will have a similar vector representation. So for example, two identifiers that have more or less the same meaning, let's say uh, index and i and i and d um, will have a similar vector representation, or at least this is the goal um, of these token embeddings. Let's just have a look at um, a concrete embedding that um, uh, was learned in some, in some project to get an idea of how this could look like. So in this case, you see um, vectors that are projected into two dimensions. So that's a very, very short vector size. Typically, the vector size is more something like 100 or 200, but you can project it into um, a lower dimensional space. And this is exactly what you see here, where we have a projection into 2D. Now, each of these um, points here in the space corresponds to one token in our vocabulary. And what you see is that um, uh, tokens that are semantically similar to each other, for example, container and wrapper, happen to be close to each other. So this encodes um, some semantic similarity between these um, tokens in the vector space. Um, also here, what you see is basically all identifiers, or in this case, arrow, also a literal, that are related to messages and alerts and errors. So this is also um, closely related. And these three here all happen to correspond to some kind of sequential data structure, a list or a sequence. Having such an embedding is pretty nice because it basically enables you to bring some of the semantic information that you have about tokens, for example, which identifiers mean similar concepts um, into the vector space. And this will enable the model to reason about these semantic relations between individual tokens instead of just seeing them as um, yeah, a sequence of some data that uh, we don't know anything about. Now, the big question is how can we get such a vector embedding um, for our token vocabulary? There are essentially two options, which we'll briefly discuss now, and then we'll look more into, into one of them. Option one is to learn this embedding function E that maps each token into a vector space jointly with the rest of the model. So the, there is some model that we care about, right? Maybe it predicts bugs, maybe it predicts types, maybe it does something else with code, but there's a model that is going to be trained. And while training this model, we are also learning this uh, embedding function E jointly with the rest of the model. Um, this basically works in, in such a way that at first every token is encoded in some more naive way, for example, using the one-hot encoding. And then the very first step of this model is to have a projection of this, um, for example, one-hot encoding into a smaller um, dimensional vector, which will then serve as the embedding. And as the rest of the model is trained, this function is also learned. What is nice about this option one is that the embeddings that you get will be a good fit for the um, downstream application that you care about. So for example, if your model is about bug detection, then these embeddings are specifically learned to be um, well suited for bug detection. Option two is to not train this model jointly with the rest of the model, but to pre-train a separate embedding model ahead of time which has the big advantage that we can specialize a neural architecture just for learning a good embedding. And we'll actually look into some um, of these embedding models in the next few minutes. So the big advantage is that we are likely to get a better embedding simply because the model is really made for this. And another advantage is that we can do this pre-training once on a huge corpus of code, which may not even be the corpus that we are learning on um, when we train the rest of the model. And then we can just reuse this uh, pre-trained embedding over and over again, as long as we stay in the same programming language. So for the rest of this um, part of the module, um, we'll um, yeah, focus on this option two and look into some options for um, pre-training an embedding model for tokens. One very popular way of learning embeddings, not only of tokens and code, but also of words and natural language, is the word to back model. So this model originally was proposed for natural language information, um, for example, for texts and the words that you have in text, but nowadays has also been adopted very um, frequently for reasoning about source code, because you can basically apply the same kind of idea to a sequence of tokens as to a sequence of words. 
So the basic idea of word to wag is uh, what is called the uh, contextual hypothesis, which basically um, is summarized in this one sentence you see here, um, saying that uh, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. So the context that um, is around a word tells you something about the word itself. So if you just look at the words in um, um, yeah, among which a particular word or token is occurring very often, then this will tell you something about the meaning of this of this token. And if um, two tokens are occurring in similar context, then these two tokens are likely to be similar. And this is the key idea that word to is using. And we'll see um, um, two variants of this um, of this idea that um, we can then use to actually learn a vector embedding of tokens. Um, based on the context in which these tokens occur. So let's have a look at the first of the two variants of um, the word to vec model that we want to talk about here. And this is the so-called continuous bag of words model. And continuous bag of words is often abbreviated as SIBO. So the basic idea of this um, model is that you can predict a token or a word from the surrounding tokens or words um, that um, um, occur around it. So basically, if I give you a piece of code and I'll tell you um, a couple of tokens, then a gap in the middle, and then another couple of tokens, then you should be able to guess what the token in the middle is. And this guessing is exactly what the model is learning to do, because not only a human can do this, but in this case also a model. So basically what it's trying to do is to predict a token from the given context, so the surrounding tokens. So what we eventually want to get out of the model is basically a vector representation of um, the uh, token. Let's say this is called token i. And what is given as the input to this model is um, a sequence of tokens before this token uh, ti. So let's say ti minus 2 and ti minus 1. You could, of course, also have a larger window of, of context and also um, some tokens that follow afterwards. So let's say ti plus 1 and ti plus 2. And now what we'll do is we are um, in the most simple version of this model, at least, just feeding all of this information that is given through a hidden layer. And then from there, um, we want to predict the token that is missing in the middle. And as usual, um, these connections here are determined by um, some matrices that are learned. So let me just note down a few more things here. So this is the um, input layer. Then we have this hidden layer in the middle. Let's call it H. And then we have this output layer Y at the end. Um, now this context size can of course be different. So what we have here is a context of size four. So now let's have a look at how the hidden layer and then also the output layer Y is computed from the input layer X. So one um, common way of computing Y is the following, where we um, say that, oh sorry, computing H is the following, where we are basically taking all the uh, tokens that are given. So all the uh, TJs for J, where J is actually um, going in this case from uh, i minus 2 to i plus 2 and in general this will be i minus k divided by 2 to i plus k divided by 2 but without i itself because we do not know the ith token obviously otherwise the task would be very simple and what we do here is to just sum all these vectors then we multiply them with our um, weight matrix U and U is what is of course going to be um, learned while training and then we um, just normalize this um, by the number of input tokens 
k. And then once we have y, we can also compute, uh, sorry, once we have h, we can also compute y. And here we will use a softmax function to basically get the probability of individual tokens um, to be the token that we want to predict. So in this case, y will be the result of softmax applied to um, this second weight matrix v times our hidden vector h. Now SIBO is one variant how Virtuvec uh, can be implemented. There is another second variant that also turns out to be pretty effective and that is also um, used pretty often and this is called SkipGram. So in SkipGram we are basically trying to solve the inverse problem of what we've just seen in SIBO because now we are predicting the context of a given token given this token. So you can think of um, me giving you a specific token in a program and then I'm asking you, hey, what do you think are the tokens that come just before and just after this given token? So what is given here as the input is um, the token TI and that what, what we want to get as the output are, for example, the two tokens before and the two tokens afterwards. So this would be TI minus two, TI minus one, ti plus 1 and ti plus 2. And again, um, the most simple way of doing this is to just have one hidden layer in the middle where we feed in the given uh, token ti, which is represented as a one hot vector. And then from there, we want to predict um, these surrounding tokens. And as usual, each of these steps is controlled by some weight matrix um, called u and v. So again, this will be the input layer X. This in the middle is our hidden layer. And then what we want to predict here is the output layer. Now let me also tell you how this, um, these layers are computed. So given X, what H will be is simply the uh, multiplication of this weight matrix that is going to be um, learned with the input layer and then once we have h we can um, um, predict all the output tokens again using the softmax function which for each of these tokens gives us um, a probability distribution over the possible set of tokens and this softmax is applied to uh, v times h um, and at the end what we'll get is for each of these four tokens a prediction what is the most likely a token to occur here in the context of the given token ti. All right, so now you've seen these two variants, SIBO and SkipGram of the Virtuvec model, but um, what they basically do is predict either the token or the context from the other piece of information. But what you actually care about at the end um, is how we can get an embedding. So now let's have a look at how to get an embedding once we have these um, SIBO or SkipGram models. So in both cases, the idea is the same. And the idea is that we first train a model for this um, pseudo task that um, we've just seen. So um, either we have this SIBO-like model that um, takes the context and predicts the uh, missing token, or we have, the, um, have it the other way around, the SkipGram uh, model that takes a token and then tries to predict some context. So what we'll do in both cases is to first train the model to be um, good at this. And then once the model has become good at um, actually predicting um, the token itself or the context of the token, we then look at this um, uh, hidden layer here in the middle. And what this hidden layer essentially is, is a summary of the given token. It either is a summary based on the context or a summary based on the token itself. But in both cases, we will be able to use this hidden layer as a vector representation of the token in the middle of this token TI. So essentially what we do here is we uh, wait until the network um, has become good at this pseudo task.
and waiting here doesn't really mean just sitting around and wait, but we're actually training the model in order um, to have a good model um, for this pseudo task. And once the model is good at this task, um, we are using this hidden layer, which essentially is a vector. And it's um, this vector that um, I've already marked with blue up there. We are using this layer as the vector representation or as the embedding for our token TI. So now this virtual vec model works pretty well and it has been used widely in a couple of uh, analyzing software with deep learning uh, applications, but it has one big um, problem and this is the out of vocabulary problem. Essentially what this means is the following. We will have some set of tokens that we consider to be our vocabulary, which we will use while training this embedding model. And then once we have trained it, at some point we want to predict things on a different set of code and what may happen is that this set of code that we use during prediction contains some tokens um, that we have never seen during training. Now, because um, the word to vec embedding doesn't really know anything about these tokens, all we can do is to represent it as a special unknown token, which basically means we are throwing away all the information that we have in these tokens. And this may actually be very valuable information. So for example, um, this may happen if we want to um, do the prediction on a program that comes from a different domain than the code that we have trained on. And then in this new domain, there will be some identifier names that never appeared in our training data. But what we'll do is we basically throw away all this information because we do not really know anything about those tokens. One nice idea for addressing this out of vocabulary problem is to not only learn embeddings on entire tokens, but to also look at the so-called subtokens, so basically uh, substrings of the given token. So the way this addresses the problem is that we now learn an embedding for each subtoken. And once we see another token that was not in our uh, training data, then maybe we can compose this new token from some subtokens that we have already seen during training. So as a concrete example, um, consider this um, name set height that might be just some method name in a piece of Java code, for example. We could, for example, decompose this into two subtokens, set and height. And once we um, see another identifier, for example, modify height um, during uh, prediction, then maybe we already have information about this um, subtoken height and maybe from some other um, token we've seen during uh, training, we also know something about modify. And from these two embeddings of modify and height, we can put them together and get some representation of uh, modify height. Now, one question related to this subtoken idea is how to actually construct these subtokens. In the previous example, I just used the typical conventions for splitting identifier names, and that's a very good. Um, first approximation, but there are also more uh, general approaches for addressing this problem of um, yeah, basically um, yeah, decomposing a token into subtokens so that we can then learn embeddings for each of these subtokens. One of them is the fast text approach, which is yeah, a follow-up work on um, um, Virtuvec that significantly improves Virtuvec by decomposing tokens into their so-called character engrams. So a character n-gram is basically just um, a sequence of n consecutive characters that appear consecutively in um, a given token. And now what fast text is doing is to learn an embedding for each such n-gram in a given token using a word to vec like skip gram model. And then once these embeddings for the individual n-grams have been learned, it's using all the n-grams that appear in a given token to compute the embedding of this token. So given some token T, it's basically looking at all the um, subtokens or n-grams um, in uh, T. And for each of those subtokens S, it's computing the embedding. And then it sums up all these embeddings to get one embedding for the entire token T. And the nice thing about this is that um, even if um, our training data did not include exactly the token that um, we need during prediction, 
probably we have seen some of the engrams in this token and then we can reuse this information to get an embedding um, for this uh, new token. So let's have a look at a concrete example to illustrate this idea of fast text a little more. So let's say our given token is the one that we've already seen earlier, namely get height. And let's assume that um, the n for the n-grams here is three. So we're basically um, caring here about three grams. So three consecutive characters at a time. So let's have a look at all the three grams that we have in this um, given token. So the first three characters would be one of them. Then we would have the next three characters. So et and h as another one, th and i as another one. Um, these three would be yet another one and those and finally also G, H and T as another one. So as you can see, some of them make sense. So get is also a word on its own. Some of the other ones do not really make sense. But what fast text is doing is just blindly extract all the n grams or three grams in this case from the given token. And then for each of them, we get some embedding. So we get an embedding of this one and we get an embedding of this one and also an embedding of this one and the same here right so we at the end will have six different embeddings and then all of these embeddings are summed up and this at the end gives us the embedding of the token t where t is this token here, um, the get height token that, that we are given. So fast text is one way how a, a, an embedding can be learned on particular subtokens of a given token. And as you've seen, these subtokens are extracted in a pretty generic way by just looking at these n-grams. Another alternative approach that actually uses the given data, the given, the given corpus of um, of code, or in this case, the given vocabulary to um, compute these subtokens is an algorithm called byte pair encoding. So you can think of this as a compression algorithm, but it also, as a side effect, gives us um, a list of subtokens to consider for a given token. So let me try to explain how this byte pair um, encoding works. What um, we are doing at the very beginning is to um, have just one subtoken for each character in our vocabulary. So if um, our vocabulary just consists of um, tokens formed from um, yeah, uh, Latin characters, then basically A to Z would be the subtokens that we start with. And then there's this um, big loop that basically tries to create new subtokens by always finding two existing subtokens that we already have and looking for the pair that is most frequent across our entire um, vocabulary. So maybe if we have all the characters at the beginning, then we maybe see that, um, let's say, uh, G and E together happens very often because there are many um, um, tokens that contain get and other things that contain a G followed by an E. And this is, so let's say G, E is the most uh, common um, pair of um, uh, uh, subtokens that are uh, that appear consecutively, then what what the algorithm will do is to join G and E into a new subtoken by just merging these two um, together. And this is done repeatedly until we have some given number of subtokens in our set of subtokens um, um, and, and, and this number is configurable. So you can basically um, uh, configure how long this whole byte pair encoding algorithm will run. And what it gives you as a side effect is an ordered list of merge operations. So each of these merge operations that we've found um, in, this, in this loop is added to this list L of merge operations. And now once we have this and we are now given a token that we would like to represent, then we will split um, this token T into characters and then merge these characters and also the um, later on um, larger subtokens using all the operations that we have in L by using the same order um, that we've used to put these operations into L. So what we'll do first is to basically merge individual characters and then merge um, larger subtokens into each other, always giving um, a new subtoken that is already in our list of subtokens. And, and this way, we basically find a decomposition of the given token T into subtokens, such that the most common subtokens 
that have appeared or do appear in our data are used instead of just using all engrams as what we've seen in uh, fast text. All right, so now you've seen also this um, third way of handling the vocabulary problem um, for tokens, where we compute an embedding that um, maps every given token into a vector. And all of these approaches um, have the common feature that the vector that we'll get is constant, even when the code, uh, code corpus grows. And the reason is that we can basically specify this this uh, vector size. For example, if you use word to vec we can specify the size of the hidden layer and this will then be the size of the embedding um, that is learned. Yeah, and this is already it in this second of three parts on uh, code vocabulary and token embeddings. I hope you have learned something. So thank you very much for listening and see you next time.